Go up or down? So Pete, uh, Pete wasn't exactly very brainy, and he hung out with some unsavory characters, including a guy by the name of Paul Jansen. Uh, but Pete was great on the baseball field. His nickname given to him by Whitey Ford, Charlie Hustle. And it was probably an apropos nickname. The Major League Baseball Rule 21D. Any umpire, any player, or club, or league official, or employee, who shall bet any sum whatsoever on any baseball game in connection which the better has a duty to perform shall be declared permanently ineligible. That was the rule that tripped up Pete Rose in 1989. I had interviewed Pete Rose in um, spring training of 1989 down in Plant City, Florida. Didn't seem anything was wrong. We didn't know at that time that Peter Uberoth was monitoring Pete. And Peter, was, Peter Uberoth was leaving his job, tossed out of baseball for a little thing called collusion that would bite baseball in the back about three years later because he suggested all the owners should not bid for players uh, to keep down salaries. And uh, in 1990, um, an arbitrator found in favor of the players. It was Peter Ubrot's fault. But anyway, Pete Rose. Pete Rose is being investigated. And Bart Giamatti takes over as commissioner of baseball. His assistant is Faye Vincent. And their number one problem in 1989 is not collusion, but Pete Rose. They know he's betting. They think they could prove that he's betting on games. He's the manager of the Cincinnati Reds at the time. However, there was no evidence ever discovered that Rose bet against the Cincinnati Reds, his team. But Rose's betting slips, written in his own handwriting, as well as other evidence, indicate he only bet on certain Reds games. Now, I have a friend, or I had a friend, named Bobby G, who worked at Sports Phone at the time. Sports Phone, I don't know if you remember Sports Phone or not, 976-1212, that was the number. And uh, you called and they gave you all the games. The New York Yankee Public Relations Director at that time, Joe Safety, called it a conduit for betters. He was absolutely correct. Pete Rose had the inside line at Sports Phone and would call up on specific games. They got to know Pete on a first name basis. They couldn't figure out why Pete was asking about this game, that game, that game, this game. But Bobby G said, he's a hell of a nice guy. Never, ever, ever let on to that he was betting on baseball. But he bet on the Reds. Rose was informally questioned in February 1989 by Uberoth. I saw him in March of 1989 in Plant City. Nothing was going on. And also Giamatti. Rose vehemently denied the allegations. This time, Giamatti takes over, and Ubroth says, you deal with it. He's gone. Sports Illustrated gives the first detailed report of the allegations that Rose placed bets on baseball games, March 21st, 1989. That is the insufferable John Dowd. I call him insufferable because I dealt with John Dowd, and he was one of the most unpleasant people I ever dealt with in terms of reporting. He was absolutely convinced that Pete Rose was the devil, and he was out to get him. That's John Dowd. Um, Dowd would give these news conferences. After, he interviewed people like Paul Janssens, who was Pete Rose's mate when they were working out. Uh, also, bookies and bet runners. He delivers his summary of his findings to Giamatti in May 1989. Now, baseball had known that Rose was hanging out with unsavory people for a very, very long time and did nothing about it. Dow documented Rose's alleged activities gambling in 1985, 1986. A day-by-day -day account of Rose's alleged betting on baseball games in 1987 when he was the manager of the Cincinnati Reds. 52 games, 52 games Rose bet on uh, in 1987, wagered a minimum, a minimum of $10,000 a day. Uh, I was told by people who grew up in the Pete Rose neighborhood, because we were interviewing everybody at that time in 1989 about Rose, that betting was a way of life where Pete Rose grew up. 
and that he didn't see anything wrong with it, he being Pete, continuing what he did as a kid, which was betting. Oh, or he'd go over the river to Kentucky and bet. Uh, Rose kept denying, saying, no, 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 not me, not me, not me. Dowd kept saying, yes, yes, yes. Rose eventually would sue baseball, would end up in the Ham Hamilton County Commission Court. He was looking for an injunction so he can continue uh, his managing of the Reds. The night before, we were at a uh, party, uh, a, a baseball party in New York at one of the hotels, and Giamatti was there. And Giamatti was explaining, we will see what we will see in court tomorrow. He also gave Steve Levy, who was then with Channel 2, now with ESPN, a toll dressing down, a 25-minute civics dissertation about what you do in court and what you can and can't say outside of court that day. Giamatti was a tough, tough guy, smart guy, too. Uh, but they were out to get Pete, and they were going to make sure they got him. Pete Rose agreed to a lifetime ban for Major League Baseball on August 23rd, 1989. I was there. I covered it. Why did he have a ban? Well, he figured he was going to get back in baseball. But there was another thing. Major League Baseball says, we're going to ban you permanently, but we're not going to say whether you bet on anything or not. Rose was pretty convinced that he'd sit out a year or two and then would be back in baseball. Giamatti would drop dead about six days later. Faye Vincent became commissioner, and he carried Bart's torch, and really carried Bart's torch, to the point where he wouldn't even want to talk about Pete Rose. Uh, did Pete Rose kill Bart Giamatti? Possibly. Maybe five packs of cigarettes a day also. <laughs> Uh, killed Giamatti. Giamatti was a tough guy, really tough guy. You always question why you're asking a question. Uh, but Rose is on the outside looking in. And there he is, the hit king, 4,192 hits, Pete Rose, Charlie Hustle. He would kind of get back into baseball a little bit. In 1999, he's named to one of the all-time greatest 20th century teams. But he lost his eligibility to go into the Hall of Fame. The debate remains. Should he go into the Hall of Fame as just a player and put on his plaque permanently suspended from baseball for gambling? Uh, he was on Fox TV for a little while on baseball. It's Roger Kahn. Roger Kahn actually wrote a book about Pete Rose in 1989. And Kahn, Pete Rose, my story, said he repeatedly asked Rose, did you bet on baseball? And Kahn said, I have too much respect for the game. After the book came out, Rose told an interviewer, yes, I did bet on baseball. Kahn said, I wanted to vomit. He also wrote The Boys of Summer, Roger Kahn. Now I'm going to switch a couple sports here, the CCNY team. How many of you used to go up to the Borscht Belt to Cutchers or Gross Singers or the Pines or Brickman or Browns or, or Gross Singers or Concord? How many of you used to do that? Because in the epicenter of basketball was the Catskills in the 1950s in the summer. The bad guys, the gamblers were always up there, and they got the CCNY team, and they paid off some players to throw games uh, with CCNY. 32 college basketball players, seven schools around the country, caught in a point-shaving scheme for the schools, New York. Three of these schools were at the state, including Kentucky. The players had been on the CCNY 1950 team, which was the first and only team ever to win the NCAA and NIT championships. Uh, the NFL, Paul Horning, Alex Karras, Pete Rozelle. Uh, Karras and Horning were betting. Karras with the Detroit uh, Lions at the time and Horning with the Green Bay Packers. And I'm not sure when he had the time because he was also uh, in the military reserve at that point uh, and coming in and kicking on weekends for the Packers in 1962. Anyway, they were suspended for one year. Uh, they came clean, and Pete Rozelle allowed them to come back. They were uh, betting about $500 a week uh, with known gamblers. Rozelle said neither player bet on or against his own teams. His suspension was dropped after the 1963 season. Uh, another one I covered, Tim Donahue, NBA, David Stern. David Stern, who is... 
meticulous in everything he does, one of the smartest people I've ever met, one of the guys who could be called one of my mentors because when I do the politics of sports business, David Stern told me exactly how sports business operates. Government, cable TV, corporate, you need everything from government, regulates taxes on corporate, also regulates cable TV. That was David Stern's contribution to me. And then one day he said to me, I've created a monster. I said, live with it. By the way, if you want to see David, you go down to a deli in Scarsdale. He's there every Friday morning. His father owned a deli in Manhattan. He kind of feels like he needs to be in a deli. So he's there every Friday morning in Scarsdale. Anyway, Donahue was a rogue ref. Or was he a rogue ref? He got involved with gamblers. He was refereeing games. He had a system where he worked out fixes by calling fouls. And he would call the gamblers and say, this is what I'm doing. And uh, he was nabbed. In 2007, there was an FBI investigation, not an NBA investigation, an FBI investigation of Donahue that he bet on NBA games and fed information to other gamblers. He fell into debt. And that's what got him eventually. Donahue would go to jail. That's Connie Hawkins. Connie Hawkins before there was Dr. J, Julius Irving before there was Michael Jordan. There was Connie Hawkins, who may have been the best of all of them. Connie Hawkins was going to school in Iowa. He was from Brooklyn. He was born in 1942. He's going to school in Iowa in 1960. And he is caught hanging around Jack Malinus. Malinus was one of the guys who fixed basketball up in the Catskills back in the 1950s. He just hung around him, and for that, he got thrown out of school, and the NBA said, never again. So he's booted from the University of Iowa after testifying in the 1961 point-shaving case. He was not charged with anything except hanging out with the wrong people at the wrong time. He never played one game at Iowa. He ended up in the American Basketball League and then the Harlem Globetrotters, and he would get back into the National Basketball Association in 1968-69. He had played in the American Basketball Association for two years. My friend, the late Shelley Saltman, was a, who just passed away a month ago, was a part owner of the Phoenix Suns. They had lost the NBA draft first pick, which was Lou Alcindor, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and they were looking for a player, and they told Connie, you're doing the $6 million antitrust suit against the NBA, we'll pay for it. The Suns paid for it. All of a sudden, the NBA got wind that the Suns were paying for his lawsuit, and they said, Connie, you're welcome to come in the league. They wanted no part of that lawsuit. The other guys who were also tossed in 61, Doug Moe, who ended up with a long, long NBA career, uh, as a coach and then a broadcaster, Roger Brown, who never played in the American Basketball, uh, National Basketball Association, Association. He played in the American Basketball Association in Indianapolis, eventually would become a law enforcement person. All ended up in the American Basketball Association. They were banned by J. Walter Kennedy, the NBA commissioner. Brown and Hawkins are both in the Hall of Fame in Springfield. You know who this guy is? Henry Hill? Good fellas. So you know who he is, right? Henry Hill. He's in the middle of a college basketball scandal in 1978. Uh, there was a Dixie Classic uh, down in the South in 1961, ended because of point shaving. Boston College, basketball point shaving scandal, 78-79. Henry Hill is one of the ringleaders. Uh, Tulane men's basketball point shaving, 84-85. Uh, the university got rid of its basketball team for four years. Now, Henry Hill, uh, he was born in 1943. He worked his way up in the Lucchese crime family from a young age. He was arrested for drug trafficking in 1980. He goes into the Federal Witness Protection Program. Hill's life is the basis of the Goodfellas movie, Henry Hill, who is involved in one of those things. Now, it's legalized sports gambling today. Supreme Court last year, May of 2018, ruled in favor of New Jersey. New Jersey had been looking to legalize sports gambling since 2011. They kept losing and losing in court, and finally the Supreme Court says, yeah, you can have legalized sports gambling. That opens the door for not only New Jersey, but other states. Uh, and all of a sudden, legalized sports gambling, sports gambling is so bad, the states that um, 
went in New Jersey, Delaware, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Mississippi, New Mexico, and Rhode Island joining <laughs> Nevada. Sports gambling is really bad. There's Chris Christie who went after sports gambling. Uh, New Jersey tried to do it. The NFL blocked it uh, by going to court a few times. And then finally in 2018, they got there. Why did New Jersey want sports gambling? Well, part of it to boost Atlantic City's economy, which is awful. Uh, they also saw what Nevada used to do on Super Bowl Sunday, making over $150 million that day on betting, and they wanted a piece of it. Now, it's so bad gambling, it is so bad for organized sports that MGM becomes the official gaming partner of Major League Baseball. So gambling's okay, right? It's all fine, you know, the NHL has a deal, the NBA has a bunch of deals, the NBA it thinks that uh, sports gambling is going to attract more people to games, more interest to games. It may have worked this year in the NFL as people came back to television. It is so bad that uh, let's make some money off of it. But there still remains the possibility either college kids or minor league baseball players could get involved in some 1919 type thing. The minor leagues. Now, it's more likely it'll be college because the college kids need money and the games would be more widespread than it would be in minor league baseball because let's face it, when Binghamton is playing, um, I don't know, uh, whenever Binghamton, double A baseball, whoever they're playing, whether it's Hagerstown or somebody like that, there are not going to be too many people interested in betting on Binghamton baseball. But Pat O'Connor is the head of minor league baseball. You're an A ball. You got a nice bonus, but you're making $2,000 a month, and the guy comes to you and says, hey, kid, just the first pitch. Throw the first pitch outside. That's all you need to do. You're going to throw 100 more pitches before the night's out. Just make sure the first one's outside. And that's O'Connor, who runs minor league baseball. Okay, you may not affect the outcome of the game, but now you're owned. You're owned. And the next time he comes back, it may be something more. It may be more money. It may be more egregious offense. But you're owned. A young and impressionable kid is not going to know he needs to be looking over his shoulder for the rest of his career or his life. When you're in the position where this may be my last year and I've never had a good payday, someone offers me something. I'm not saying they would. And I would like to pray to God they won't. But it's a real threat. I don't think it's a threat in minor league baseball. I really don't think it's a threat in minor league baseball. But in college basketball, college basketball, more so than college football, where you only need one guy or two guys for point shaving, it's a threat. And college basketball has seen it repeatedly. There's probably way too much money in Major League Baseball now. When you see guys like Harper and Trout and Machado get all those hundreds of millions of dollars, three players, over a billion dollars for three players, probably you're not going to see it in baseball. You probably won't see it in the NFL. They're making too much money. Basketball, college, hockey. But there is point, there is fixing going on, allegedly. It's in international soccer in Europe and also tennis. There are investigations of those right now going on.